There we go. So welcome. This is uh, September 3rd, 2021. This is Alaska version three. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad to see you here. It's been a big week. Um, I'm still kind of mentally on uh, recovering from burnout on uh, getting the, uh, uh, the event earlier this week going, but I'm looking forward to chatting about it. Um, the agenda today is mostly kind of typical. I've got a few announcements at the beginning. I want to um, ask for a little bit of feedback and discussion on the reverse uh, challenge pitch that we did this week um, and um, talk a little bit about some follow-up activities and potential engagement on that. And then uh, we have some kind of next steps coming up on the calendar that I want to touch on. Uh, we'll go around for quick introductions. Uh, as always, I think everybody kind of knows everybody here for the most part. So uh, anything that uh, jumps out at you in this last week about Alaska's next economy or things that you think are changing the narrative about where we're headed. So um, I'm going to start at the top of the list that I'm building. Andy, if you wouldn't mind jumping in and uh, welcome. Show enough. Um, I'll try to keep it short, but I had a big, big week too. So um, a couple of the things that came across my radar from um, my discussion in class this week um, is, you know, as I was telling you, um, the Central Peninsula Hospital <clears throat> has a um, an inpatient year long um, treatment program for drug and alcohol abuse disorder. And um, it's something that uh, the hospital was able to um, put together and develop because they are a community owned hospital. So they are not, um, they're not part of a large hospital corporation. And so there's no need for them to take money out of the community. Um, and so unlike Alaska Regional Hospital or Providence uh, who, prioritize taking money out of the community. Um, Central Peninsula um, is owned by <clears throat> the residents of the Kenai Peninsula. And so um, every three years or so they do a survey and they uh, find out what the needs are in the community and then they um, figure out which ones they can provide safely and they do that. So in the last few years, aside from the treatment program, They've also developed um, their own oncology program. Um, so patients don't have to come up to Anchorage for oncology and they also have their own cath lab. So patients don't have to come up here for um, cardiac cath. Um, and if I wanted to live in Soldatna, I would have gone down there. They opened it up about the time that I was still running in that, that, um, that field and I would have gone down there in a heartbeat but I just didn't wanna live in Soldatna. But, Anyway, it got me really thinking about um, the value of community owned businesses because they can respond to the needs of their community. So I, I, can, I am now like absolutely totally fascinated with this model of community home owned hospitals because I'm thinking in the big picture of, you know, how do we how do we find an American answer to the need for universal health care without it being universal health care? And so I'm thinking about this model. It's like, this is just phenomenal. It's so exciting. And so I found an article about it um, from a hospital in uh, Idaho, I believe it was, or Montana, something. Um, and they were talking about how um, by being a community owned hospital, they were able to pump $97 million back into their local economy every year from money that didn't come from their local economy. So this is insurance payments, this is Medicaid, this is Medicare. So this is money, external money coming into the community and then staying in the community through um, salaries and so forth. So I asked my friend Rick, who is the CEO of Central Peninsula about that. And he said, yeah, we pump about $100 million a year back into our local economy. And I'm thinking that's amazing. Um, and they're able to respond to the needs of their community where um, a hospital, you know, the hospitals here in town don't. They only respond in ways that are gonna be profitable to them. So 
I also asked him to talk about the differences between leadership at a nonprofit hospital like Providence, because he's been to all three, and a for-profit hospital like regional, and then you know compare it to a community-owned. And he said, not even going to go there because the difference is not between nonprofit and for-profit. The difference is between corporatized and non-corporatized. And that was like this, this huge shift for me. And I think that's what, um, that's where needing to kind of regroup and think about, um, yes, big box stores put some money into our economy, but not as much as local stores would or local businesses would. If we would support that, more of that money would come back into our local economy. So that's um, kind of where I'm, my brain was going. Um, but something else that came up in that same conversation, um, another friend of mine who was a guest speaker um, had, you know, he, he is in addiction medicine. He's a, a pharmaceutical sales rep for addiction treatment medication and um, not naloxone, but another one that is more effective, but less well-known. And um, anyway, he um, was talking about how he had recently had a conversation with our new mayor and was trying to explain to him that there are no Anchorage, the Anchorage area has no inpatient treatment facilities for drug, um, drug addiction, like, you know, they do down in the, the peninsula. Um, and they have many communities outside. And also the problem of a lot of our homeless are imported from other parts of the state for a variety of reasons. Um, and so Anchorage gets sort of the brunt of the homeless, houselessness, homelessness issue. And we don't have the resources to, to, uh, to support them. Um, and the mayor was like, he was stunned. He had no idea about how, you know, why Anchorage is the hub for people who can't go back to their communities and stuff like that. And so I was like, I was just stunned that um, we have a new mayor who is absolutely, who's trying to solve the homelessness problem and has absolutely no idea what he's talking about and recently turned down the opportunity to have a, a panel um, participating in the process uh, full of people who are in this situation. So that, um, that was really not terribly surprising, but um, it made me really sad that we're back to square one here and trying to educate um, our governance, you know, what, what <clears throat> our problems are here. So I felt like there's been a, you know, more than a few large steps backwards there. Um, but anyway, other than that, um, also, I just have recognized that my um, connections from my healthcare years are huge and deep and very, very powerful. And I'm really excited to be reconnecting with some people and connecting with some new people who are very excited about being able to um, participate in educating the next generation of healthcare providers and, and healthcare managers. So it was, it's been a, a weird, but really interesting week for me. So that was a lot I'm gonna yield. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andy. It does sound like it's been a big, a, been an, a big important week. Welcome, Tracy. Uh, what's happening with you? Looks like Hi. Tracy. Uh, she oh. said that she's um, being summoned away, but that her uh, thoughts on our challenges tilt to political and the legislative gridlock, and that they can't function beyond the oil re revenue. Uh, gotcha. Thank you for that. Elijah, you're up. Hey, everybody. Um, things are going well. Uh, I'm just uh, 
watching this cryptocurrency situation pump up a bunch more buy more ethereum and uh anybody who's into it i'm into it this uh revolution on all fronts going down so hope you're well bye thanks elijah that uh, that, that cryptocurrency thing still is a head scratcher to me mita welcome glad you could join us today any uh, anything you want to share to get started today Good morning, everyone. Um, I guess a couple of things. I really appreciated being part of the AKV3 verse um, pitch challenge and kind of actually it was kind of funny because I have these kind of old business ideas that I have kept in my back pocket for like decades, right? And uh, there was never really a great place to have that supported. Um, and so all of a sudden I'm like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> I should pull some of these out. I'm excited about this. Like this might actually be possible. Um, but also having to manage everything else that I'm doing. But I guess my thoughts are uh, a couple of things. I heard you kind of the last half of what you were saying about uh, social media, which is a big part of what my team does at Eat Alaskans Take a Stand and Stand Up Alaska. So next time we have an event, um, I'll try to be more engaged and, and bring my team on board to get that out further and farther and have more people attending. Um, and then my final thought is in alignment with what Tracy said, because that's why I do so much political work, even though I'm a traditional healer and focused on, you know, like community health and wellness and um, advocating for, you know, clean environment is it always runs into law and policy. And that's one of the biggest barriers for innovation and, um, you know, just diversification and access. It's, it's always in that arena and they always prefer oil and gas and big corporations. And it makes it really difficult for grassroots or local people to get up off the ground. You're here, thank you. Pasquale, good to uh, have you here today. I was going to say see you, but I don't see you. So good to have you here today. What's up? <laughs> yeah, on Fridays, I'm usually uh, squeezing the last the last nice day that we have in <clears throat> in summertime of the world. But I'm still have I still have enough bandwidth to yeah. to connect, or at least I try. I don't want to miss this no. these meetings, especially this week. So there are some other things going going on, but if I have three minutes. It was first to say thank you to all of you that put it all together from the timing to the transition between presentations to uh, host the the event, which is not a small small feat to coordinate so many so many things. So kudos to you. That was that was great. Uh, second, I was really happy with what we saw over there. <clears throat> it went to the point which was. We are going to present challenges that we that we have, so we don't keep working on problems. No problems, sorry for using the word challenges that we are not actually uh, facing, and we actually use the energy and the time to tackle those that are actually actually there. So that was great to see that that message came across uh, clearly from people that are involved in the entrepreneurial community and also deep into the Alaska uh, economy. And so that was great. And it happened to me too. A lot of ideas that I had in the background started to, hey, hey, I wanna, I want, I want to get out because I can work on that on that too. And actually I reached out to one of my uh, friends in Spain that I don't know, just time flies. Four years ago we talked about an idea that somehow now is showed in one of the pictures. And I said, hey, hey, you know, you better remove the dust from those papers because we may i don't know let, put it all together up, update it and and you know it's it's not it's not a bad idea it's it's there <laughs> now we have the the political environment there and the third point that i wanted to make is that it was great to see that the war kb3 is doing is actually we hit the nail on the in, in the head if you use that expression because we could see that is not one dimension of the problem. Is there are multiple dimensions that are connected together to solve a situation? We saw from the technology point of view, from the political point of view, from the market point of view, 
And that is great because that was actually the approach that we use, a multidimensional approach to solve Alaska's economy, not just focus on what Kai was always saying. Oh, just legislation or just, I don't know if it was Kai, but I've heard it from, from this, from some folks. Oh, we just need to fix this. Like, well, it's not just, we need that and other dimensions of the problem to be tackled at the same time. And that was, that was there. We could see multiple people saying the same thing, saying, oh, we also need this and this and this to be in the same, in the same page. So I'm gonna stop there. I wanna keep it short. So great week, great week. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Thanks for joining us. Bradley, good to see you. I don't recall. Oh, you you were able to join the, the event. I remember we talked about your stove and I see it running, but it's good to see you again today. Any uh, quick updates for the group on what's going on with you and thoughts about what's happening in the world? Yeah, sure. Um, first, a thank you to you for the event last night. I certainly got something out of it. It was great to connect with the, the fellow uh, cohort company, Mighty Pipeline, that we're going through Launch Alaska with. So, uh, you know, launch hasn't officially started yet, so it's nice to kind of have those pre-connections. Um, and Mita, I'm not sure if you can see me, but thank you for uh, your uh, uh, seeing the event last night. <laughs> um, that was a very beautiful, uh, um, I'm not sure what to call it, but uh, respectful um, and thoughtful use of native language in the state. So I, I really appreciated that, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to just make a couple of comments uh, in, in my update in response to Andy's comments this morning about community ownership, um, as, as well as yours, Mita, about um, some of the challenges we're facing. And I think I just got a call with uh, the head of Zebras Unite in Portland, or um, one of the founders, Astrid Schultz. And I'll toss into the chat a resource that I'm kind of um, engaged in using this week to get my bylaws in order for my own company. But it's essentially a model um, of um, community stewardship. Essentially, the idea is that you get your cap table in alignment with your community, including getting your community on the cap table um, and ensuring that governance of your company uh, you know, is constrained by those commitments that you have. And, you know, we as business owners talk a lot about doing the right thing. And we certainly are active in social media trying to convince the world we're doing the right thing. But in my mind, you know, one of the, one of the ways to start to get at this Gordian knot is to start with the bylaws of a company to have the company make a commitment to a certain social purpose and to essentially ensure governance that makes that binding that actually constrains the board's ability to make decisions um, purely for profit motive. So I'm on that journey with Turnigan Heavy Lift. I'm trying to be that model and uh, create it before the company gets too big, before the cap table gets too unwieldy and I no longer have control to do it. Uh, so looking for input and ideas on what that looks like and happy to help others on that journey as well. Nice. Thanks, Bradley. Well, I'm looking forward to, to looking into that. I'm, I'm working with uh, two companies right now on their cap table, and this is timely information. Thanks. Dick, good to see you again. Anything uh, exciting uh, going on with you this week and your view of the Alaska future? Yeah, I've got a few things here, and I'm sorry I didn't make Wednesday night, but uh, I was uh, elsewhere. Um, you know, I, building on something Andy and others are saying here now kind of fits into this thing we've been talking about for so many decades about import substitution comes to mind. And what can we do here that we don't have to bring things in? So I put that into the hopper. Uh, also, I'm thinking Kai and others, uh, you know, the, the biggest cohort of, uh, you were talking about money going out, I think Andy was talking about money going out from the big healthcare companies. But when the money coming into the state, by and large, are coming from native corporations. So I'm thinking how we get more folks from the native corporations involved, village and regional, 
uh, both profit and nonprofit. So that's one thought. Um, I just got an email, some of you may have seen it also from RDC Resource Development Council teamed up with Anchorage Chamber, encouraging everyone to get their COVID shot because otherwise the economy is gonna be in deep doo-doo for a bit longer uh, due to that. Um, and I think and you folks probably have more information on and, uh, what's happening on the ground right now. The Alaska Permanent Fund, of course, I think put aside so many millions of dollars for investing in Alaska businesses. So I'm wondering if we should have somebody from there try, uh, try to get them tied into our group. And then the last thing, uh, go over to Bradley about the community uh, stewardship. Uh, maybe I can get you to be a guest speaker, Bradley, at my next graduate OD class uh, and talk about that because it really gets into corporate mission and socially responsible, uh, you know, whether it's mission or actions or core beliefs. So that's, that's another thing. But we're down here at Alyeska. There's visitors from everywhere you can imagine. And uh, at least it looks vibrant down here. So uh, I'll leave it at that. We had a nice breakfast at the bake, bake shop and we had uh, diet cinnamon rolls. So that, that's my aversion to reality. Hey, I don't know where you find those diet cinnamon rolls. Every time I go down there, they just don't quite seem to have, they, maybe they've run out of them because you've already gotten all the diet ones. It, it's all a state, state of mind. Yeah, the, the ones I see left there don't seem to pass the diet. To, <laughs> <laughs> that's it that's it for me cool thanks dick taylor good to see you thanks for joining us today anything uh, you'd like to share just to kick things off yeah well thanks again for the invitation to present at the event garrett i had a very good time we had some great follow-up um involvement some interest um it's great to rep some food and the uh, ocean economy one thing i think that's very much on our mind we had a conversation with isaac uh yesterday morning at launch um, and this question around policy is one that um, we're realizing we need to spend a little bit more time working on. Um, so expect to hear a little bit more from us on that probably here in the, in the near future. One thing I just would flag um, as an example of this is um, the Pollock industry in Alaska just got slapped with a $300 million um, Jones Act violation fine, which they're going to fight in court. But um, how that you know affects us directly is that it has really iced a lot of our conversations about um, industry support for our program and for innovation in general. Um, you know, the Pollock industry every year only produces about 150 to 300 million in direct seafood value um, from that cash. So essentially, um, the feds have just levied a fine equal to the entire value um, of the initial harvest there. So that's, you know, a real issue um, for them. And uh, just another example of there's always a crisis that means we can't talk about innovation today, we have to talk about innovation tomorrow. Yeah, um, exactly right. <laughs> and so we're, we're very interested in working with other folks on, on bringing that kind of message about, um, you know, that that cycle needs to, to be broken, um, because it's something that's been happening in the seafood and ocean space for a very long time. Um, from talking with Isaac, it sounds like it's very common in the renewable utility space as well. Oh. Um, and I'm sure probably most other uh, established mature industries, you probably hear very similar things. Um, so that's one area where we're really, really very interested. Um, we're also very interested in, in connecting with more companies. We've got um, six in the portfolio right now or in the, in the cohort. Um, expect to see more on those soon when our new website launches. Um, but we've got about three or four more that we think are going to be adding. Uh, we're going to be adding in the next uh, month. But if anyone knows anyone who's working on um, ocean-friendly technologies, as we're taking to calling it, um, so anyone who positively impacts people in oceans, um, we'd love to chat with them, love to start connecting them. And so that's it for me. I've got some more stuff, but um, I can connect with folks individually on some of it. That's great. Thanks. Just a quick question, Taylor. Are you connected with Brock down in the Salmon Innovation Fund as a place to find some more portfolio companies? Uh, we haven't talked with them yet, but um, they're on our list. <laughs> We've uh, Garrett and I only have so much time for meetings. Yeah. Oh, good week. enough. It's just a source of companies if you're looking for them. Okay, thanks. Absolutely. Thanks. Margo, thanks for joining us. Anything you want to uh, share with the group to, to begin with? So I will find this eventually, but um, Kai and I have talked about, I've talked about policy with a lot of people. Um, policy is one of my interest areas. It's literally what I got my master's degree in. Um, I cannot remember the name of the movement, but I learned about it this summer and it's essentially <clears throat> 
a, a public education or awareness campaign about policy issues very, very basically for startups. <laughs> now, some of the su successful campaigns have built off that significantly to start to, I think, branch out into like vertical. So, you know, ocean industry, technology startups, healthcare startups, aviation, energy, whatever, people have been able to build off of it. I will find it and I will share it with this group, but I had a couple of discussions and had a listen to a webinar early on in the summer that was a public education campaign for a state legislature around um, the way that they talked about it was essentially, you all say that you wanna see a lot more startups, a lot more innovation, a lot more collaboration between existing industries and maybe uh, new ways of doing things, yet you have an insane amount of red tape. It's just ridiculous if you expect businesses to be able to thrive here. Um, the term they used was for big businesses, we roll out the red carpet. For small businesses, we roll out the red tape. And so it was this whole campaign, it was very successful. If I remember correctly, it was done in a very conservative state. Um, so it might have a similar political landscape to what we have. I will find it eventually. I have it bookmarked on one of my like four computers. But for all those talking about policy, that might be an interesting place to start. Um, they had a lot of great information they, they shared um, that I think would be very interesting to a lot of the people who are having these policy conversations. So I cannot find it for the life of me right now, though. But since it came up on Wednesday night, I was like, right to start. Thank you, Kai. Right to start. Um, that's what it is. Uh, so some of the one of the guys who essentially created that, um, Victor... Wong. Victor Wong, thank you, um, uh, spoke with an IEDC class that I took early on in the summer. Really, really interesting. And um, I, I don't want to take up too much time on that, but policy has come up, I think, seven different conversations I've had just in the last couple of days, <laughs> startup policy or um, area specific policy that affects businesses and growth and innovation in that industry, which I consider to be kind of tied to startup policy. So I want to investigate that more and share resources with people and see who's doing what. Um, but I think that there has to often start with a, an education campaign and a lot of us sharing the same resources, we're kind of speaking the same language. Um, but other than that, the event on Wednesday I thought was fantastic. I got so many people reaching out just they said it was so full of energy and excitement and they just really, really enjoyed it. So um, hats off to you, Kai, and everybody else who helped. I thought it went super well. Thanks, Margo. I put those links in the chat for everybody, um, as well as uh, I've got a, a web page where I've been collecting policy documents and there's uh, th these couple ones as well as some other ones that um, I found along the way. But uh, sure interested in this policy issue myself. Ryan, I think you're batting cleanup. All right, let's see if we can bring it home. How's everybody doing today? I'm excited to be here as always. Uh, I am, man, I am just trying to, still trying to process this week. Um, there has been so much going on and it's just been a lot of good stuff, but I'm excited to, to see where it goes. Um, I think the big takeaways for me um, are just sort of the, the importance of alignment. And, um, you know, I have Taylor's presentation stuck in my mind um, because I think it was Garrett who said, all it is going to take is one boat who is willing to try something different. And, and that just sums up my week. You know, if we are willing to just dive in, if somebody is willing to take that risk, then we can, we can change the course of our state. And, and it's just figuring out like, who's going to take that, that jump, you know, how do you decide if that jump is right for you and, and what your specific jump looks like. Um, and I've been kind of grappling with that for myself, you know, where, where am I going to push on things? What is that going to look like? And it, it's an exciting thing uh, to be thinking about, but there's so much good work going on in our state and I'm just so stoked about it. So thanks y'all. That's my thought for the week. Well, thanks Ryan. A um, couple quick things for me, just to kind of um, do my own cleanup on this thing. First off, uh, I'm really encouraged by the note from Cliff Grow last night from Juno, suggesting that maybe Juno's um, going to work their way out of a wet paper bag and come up with some sort of uh, 
solution. And I can't tell you how much I feel like getting our state past the impasse of its financial plans is such an important next step in all of this other work we could do. As long as we're caught up in the, in the impasse we've been in, we can't get on to the more important opportunities that are out there. So any of you that have connections with your, with your legislators, um, you know, do what you can to encourage them. I think we try not to, try to get, not getting into lobbying, but, you know, support them in their work to come up with a solution. We have to be able to, to get off of this issue and move on to more important ones. Um, second um, issue here is uh, just back to kind of this flows issue, and it ties into the Invest Local program coming up here. Um, I, I put in the notes for the meeting here, uh, but I can also share the the screen on this, this idea about economic base is one of the fundamental pieces going back to the beginning of this Alaska version three and what is version three all about. And you all have been touching on really key pieces of it, but economic base is a measure of the money in an economy. And that economic base is influenced by good money. That is money that's coming into quote our bucket and the increased velocity of the money within the economy, that's the neutral money, it's not coming out, it's not going out, but the speed at which that money is being um, uh, moved and, and reinvested locally is real important. It doesn't matter if you have a huge economic base if that money's not doing anything, if you got just have it sitting in your bank account. And so being able to create investable opportunities with local money that invests in local opportunities, you speed up the, that, uh, that movement of, of the internal money is the next part of economic base. And then the third is trying to plug the leaks um, in that money that flows out and having more of our uh, extraction related economy and the value added economy that complements it being owned in Alaska means that the profits stay in Alaska. And just like the community-based healthcare systems, or I love to point out the example of Bristol Bay Native Corporation starting to buy some of the seafood processor ships a couple of years ago that are bringing those processor ships into Alaska so they control the assets, they have the profits, they control where the, where the boats are parked, who works on them. So many secondary benefits that come out of that versus the other data point of Hillcorp that bought BP's assets, which is no longer a public company. They're no longer a corporation that pays state taxes. Um, you know, just the, we have those two data points to that. So economic base is a really key framing for this and understanding those three aspects of money and being able to then, I find this super powerful to communicate this with lots of people when I'm talking about economic policy. And I encourage you when you're talking about Invest Local, this program coming up or some of these other policy issues, you know, to be able to get comfortable with this economic base concept and being able to share it with people. Because I think getting people to understand this and to think about it is a valuable way of getting them to see naturally the support for the kind of work that we might be doing. Um, second uh, key point here is somebody asked about the Alaska Investment Program. The Permanent Fund did put $200 million um, into Alaska investments. Half of it went to Bearings, uh, an East Coast uh, management firm. The other half went to McKinley Capital. Um, I'm pretty darn critical about how that money is being used. Um, and we could go into it sometime. I, you know, it might be interesting to try and get them uh, interested in what we're doing, but so far my efforts there, and, and I've got some reasonable connections there. Um, uh, that's, that, that's a head scratcher. So I'll just say, if anyone wants more information, we could look into it, trying to get that one to refocus truly on Alaska investment programs uh, is a big lift. Um, primarily, and this is the challenge here from a policy standpoint, the permanent fund saddled the Alaska Investment Program with the expectation that the returns on investment would meet or exceed the returns on the rest of the permanent fund. Which means that essentially it's forcing Bearings and McKinley Capital to put that money out of state. Because in our current economy, they can't have the fiduciary um, liability of making investments in Alaska when they know to meet the permanent fund's expectation of meeting or exceeding that, they have to invest out of state. So we put from a policy standpoint, a set of golden handcuffs on this program 
that's forcing the money to be largely invested out of state, not exclusively, um, but it has been a huge constraint. I've talked with a couple of the, the uh, fund managers within this program, and they said, you know, if you wanted to actually have investment in Alaska, you would have to have changed the policy expectations of the return on investment and how it's managed in order to allow that money to be invested in Alaska. But that's not how the policy was set up. So final point on policy is that you know, I'm continuing to develop the Alaska uh, Innovation Coalition idea um, after establishing that the um, Alliance Coalition, it's all, uh, there's another innovation alliance that's going on that Margo's familiar with. It's focused more on the accelerator program activities uh, at that level. Um, and now that I've kind of understood where they're going and what's going on, I'm continuing forward with the possibility of AKV3 being some sort of host or home for the Alaska Innovation Coalition, unless somebody else pops up doing it. But as Pasquale and I talked about yesterday, the day before, um, I'm running out of patience waiting for for, for other, other folks to do what seems like could be done. And I'm just starting to move into just starting to do some of this stuff. So at any rate, if you're interested in that idea, let me know. I'm gonna try and get to Calgary in a couple of weeks and meet with folks there I've been working with on Calgary's Innovation Coalition and I'm modeling some of the program ideas out of there. So sorry for the extra weeds there, but I just wanted to kind of disclose what was happening and discussions I'm having there also. So if you're interested in that area, it's not a surprise later. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, so, um, gosh, a, a lot of time spent on introductions this morning. It's fine. It's all good stuff. I'm just kind of watching the clock here. So the Invest Local program, um, I put a note out. I think I've got one more ticket. I, I uh, uh, AKV3, I sponsored uh, uh, AKV3 being the sponsor for Mar Margie's uh, program, Invest Local. Uh, the notes in the uh, in our meeting notes have the keynote for Michael Schumann's uh, day two presentation and his wrap up. I highly encourage you, if you do nothing else, listen to Michael's keynote or presentation about the um, value um, of, of investing local and the hidden return on investment that's actually there. People discount investing local um, as a good return. He does a great job of um, pushing back on that. I encourage any of you that are working with organizations that can assist Margie in promoting this event. She's looking for sponsors. She's looking for help in promoting it. Um, like I said, AKV3 um, sponsored it. We got four tickets uh, out of that sponsorship. Uh, I've got three of those spoken for. If any of you who've not already gotten a hold of me would like one of those seats, it's just kind of first come, first serve. Uh, to be able to get one of those seats. There's a free event for everybody on the 14th at noon. And then the, the paid set workshop sessions with Michael are on the following four weeks. The details are in the notes. So email me um, if you would like one of those remaining seats. Do look at his keynote if you do nothing else um, and potentially the 14th. Um, also, I was intrigued to see that somebody's organizing a TEDx Anchorage. If you haven't seen that, I would encourage you to go chase that down. I've got the links in our notes to, uh, to both the main site for the TEDx. They're planning on doing it November 6th. It's right on top of Startup Weekend. It's on top of Startup Week, which is not bad, but I'm kind of uh, bummed that it's on top of that. It's also on top of the King Tex um, Marketplace Day. So they, they've picked a day that's got a lot going on that, you know, it's kind of like, well, I, you know, at any rate, uh, but there's there's links in there um, also for um, if you're interested in applying to be a speaker, which is kind of where I was going. All of you are working in different areas that I think deserve the extra attention that this TEDx might provide you. So I would encourage all of you to consider um, if the work that you're doing would be something you'd like to share in TEDx. I'll certainly be looking to um, apply for something related to AKV3. Um, I haven't decided, I'll communicate that with you guys so we kind of coordinate. Well, I think I'd like to handle this kind of like what we did with the Innovation Summit, where we kind of strategized a little bit on what we we're doing because we knew we have had kind of overlapping messages in many cases. Um, so at any rate, uh, I'll, I'll keep this on the agenda for the next couple of weeks, encourage you to look at that and apply. Like I said, all of you are doing work that uh, would be valuable on the stage there. Um, What's the date on that again? November 6th. Yeah, I, I'm out of town. Yeah, I don't know what the uh, application date is for that. I'm also assuming that it's going to be probably streamed um, for folks that uh, want to do that. Uh, and then finally, most of you probably know about this, but just to put it out there, the Accelerate Alaska um, conference hasn't been held for a couple of years. It's scheduled for November 11th and 12th. That's the end of startup week. 
Um, and uh, I, uh, I, I dodged a request from Ross to manage one of the tracks on that just because of the other startup, week, startup weekend stuff. But it is going on 11th, 12th. I've been asked to, to do uh, some sessions. I think some of you were probably involved in some of the sessions, but I would encourage you to put that on your calendar. I think it's a, a good uh, conference that really complements um, our V3 economic development message. So uh, I think it's something to, for all of you to support, help promote, and potentially um, uh, let, you know, let us know if we can help promote work that you're doing or sessions you're doing. Okay. Um, let's circle around on the the challenge event for any feed up. I basically just wanted to have an open discussion for a moment about what went well, what could we um, do differently next time um, to improve. Okay. Hi, I had a real quick question for you. Um, yes, how on your bucket diagram, um, one thing that's helpful is to differentiate sources of capital and what their uh, interests are. And so, you know, I agree with you on the McKinley Capital um, and bearings capital, um, putting the you know rate rate of return very first and foremost in the conversations has been somewhat of a very easy way to kill any discussion. Um, but how much of a discussion have you had with other sources of capital which are more suited for some of the projects um, that have approached McKinley? So like banks, um, more of the small you know medium enterprise funders, so SBA, um, various lenders out of Seattle who can provide SBA backed loans. Has there been much of a discussion with any of those folks? Because they seem to be a better source than a, you know, eight to nine percent annualized target return fund that's looking for direct equity on something with, you know, Delaware registration that may not be super suitable for Alaska. Yeah, exactly. I don't think I have a quick, easy answer for that. I know that um, because we have a state that does not allow or, or doesn't offer non-recourse loan type instruments, um, that the banking industry is really not a great source of capital and that non-recourse policy is, is a key barrier in that area. Um, and, and I'm not sure how to, how to unwind that problem, but sources of capital for midterm companies that are looking for expansion capital for inventory and expanding their sales have uh, really struggled to find any source of capital. Most of them though, um, and I'm thinking of two that I've been a little closer to are having some success in some of the clear bank type of strategies that are doing revenue redemption type of, of funding, which are essentially short-term loans that are paid back through a, a structure where um, immediate revenue is being used to pay back the loan. So it's kind of a variable return. If your sales go up, you repay more of the loan, your sales go down. So rather than having fixed loan payments, uh, it's a variable loan payment. Um, and we've also seen the Alaska Investor Network providing a variety of bridge loans and revenue redemption type mm -hmm. of loans in that area. Fundamentally, though, what you're touching in is a broader issue with a proposal that, um, and, and Isaac and I were just talking about this yesterday about, uh, you know, I'm trying to look at the new SSBCI uh, funding that may come through the state at this point is I've been promoting uh, launching a corporate venture capital strategic investment fund to try and get more corporate um, entities involved in early stage investing, because that's our big gap in this economy. We have a lot of the other pieces in there. What we're missing is that mid-tier corporate strategic investing for early stage companies. So I'm proposing a, a basically a training fund to try and launch that. So I'd be happy to dive into the weeds with you or anyone else that wants to go further into it. That's kind of my quick rift on, on what you're relating to. There's, there's definitely a structural uh, challenge in there. And those are some of the elements I see in it. Yeah, the, the comment that kind of prompted this question was someone um, who was trying to get a small business loan um, out of a local credit union made the remark, which I thought very insightful, um, which was that it was easier to get a small loan um, to buy a side by side to go tear up mud and, and mat sue than it was to get a loan to start a small business that created productive um, economic activity. And I thought that that was a very interesting point and one that might be worthy exploring for this, this group, especially. Yeah, and, and I'd, I'd offer just quickly that what you're running into there is basically the non-recourse issue. That, yeah. that, that what they're offering easily is a loan that is done because somebody has sufficient assets, a house, yeah. retirement account, or anything like that. Uh, and as long as you have that, then yeah, the banks will write you loans all day long. Um, but if you want to get a business loan and you want to be able to potentially shield your house or the bank knows that under bankruptcy, your house and some of your retirement assets are going to be shielded and they're not going to offer a non-recourse loan, which means they don't have recourse to try and recover that, uh, then they basically waive that off because they know they can't take your house at the end of the day. Um, I, 
I also wonder how much of it has to do with loan officers at some of these institutions being far more familiar with what it takes to underwrite, um, you know, some small vehicle, you know, boats, ATVs, campers. That's a very much more familiar thing for them. And how many of these banks actually understand some of the smaller business startup underwriting that they need to be doing? You know, it seems like that could be an area for targeting, getting some more people into the conversation is looking for some of those loan officers. This may be a bit of an Elmer Rasmussen influenced view, but, you know, getting the branch managers in some of these conversations could be interesting. Just to kind of jump into that on, on what you both are talking about, um, wearing the hat as a bootstrapped hardware startup. Um, I guess I'll say shout out to the Muni for finally coming through on a $10,000 CARES Act grant that I applied for a year ago. So super stoked uh, about that. Uh, I realize I'm seeing this on a recorded call, but yeah, thanks. That's four months of runway for me. And, you know, bootstrap startups don't, don't die when they run out of money. They just go to sleep and slow way down. So if the founders are committed and that's, you know, that's great. That's juice. And that of course is federal dollars. And we're also going for two SBIRs right now or an active review. So it would be nice if we could get something other than federal dollars supporting these efforts. Cause I'm trying to build a company for Alaska and solve Alaska problems. But, you know, to, to Kai's point about changing expectations on ROI, the only like, as a matter of philosophy, the only way I can think of to do that is to make fiduciary responsibility secondary. I, I don't know how else you're gonna do that. You're, you're certainly not gonna get a board to agree to it if, if that's their aim. So anyway, hey, thoughts and, and gratitude, maybe, thanks. Maybe I'm slightly uh, old fashioned, but my, my take is, you know, the fiduciary thing is, is important to preserve for investors. Um, maybe if we were setting up um, a fund again and APFC was to look at this, it seems the problem really is in how you talk about what the money is for um, and then what you, how, you, how you manage that. If your goal was APFC to get money into the VC market, um, great. If it's to stimulate Alaska economic development, well, it may be in conflict with that. And so that's, that's where it seems to be, we need like a, a little bit more of a, like just conversations between John Wanamaker at McKinley and various folks at APFC and this crowd to say, look, VC is not the avenue to economic development um, that it may appear to be in Silicon Valley or elsewhere. Um, and that's where I think Kai, like bringing in the banks would be a, a better way of um, getting at some of this, like how do you keep some of that money internally? Because that's Alaskans savings being used for loans to support local businesses. That's that circular economy versus some VC money, which, you know, might be a 10 year exit. Um, and a lot of that money may at some point to continue growth, it may not be Alaskan capital that's follow on. So that's where I think we, there's some perception shifts that need to happen. Sorry, I jumped in there really hard. <laughs> uh, no, no worries. I mean, it, it, these are all part of what we've been doing is surfacing issues that kind of affect uh, being able to create the V3 economy and what we're touching on here is is one of those barriers in there. Uh, I'll reach out to John Wanamaker and see if he's up for a discussion sometime soon to, to sit down and kick some of the stuff around and try and strategize a little bit on what's happening, what isn't, and how might it be done differently in the future to address some of the increased access to capital for local investing and, and our economy. Yeah, I would offer and uh, I also want to spin off in different directions today, uh, but you know, there's a fundamental issue about the perception that startups and innovation are somehow competing with the existing economic players. Uh, and at some point we have to kind of reframe the discussion so they see it as complementary and as there's a net win-win as opposed to if we create a startup somehow that hurts an existing business, which is, is I think the wrong way to look at it, but it's what I run into when I deal with folks on the city assembly about their allocation of CARES Act money or dealing with the state legislators um, about their allocation at the state level. They see it as a, as a win-lose discussion. And I think that's got to change. And that gets back to Margo's uh, also her reference in the Startup USA and Right to Start policy discussions is changing people's narratives uh, as is one of the four pillars of this whole effort we're doing um, because the narrative has to be different for people to see the path ahead differently. Um, yeah, go for it, Ryan. 
in the the theme of my week for for being the you know the first in and kind of just being willing to to take the plunge um who's going to set up the fund that focuses on alaskan investment who's going to decide to do it differently and then how do we just prove that it can be done i mean is this a employee stock owned investment firm what is, i have no idea how to structure this or what this looks like or how to go about raising funds for this but um why aren't we doing it <laughs> why are we waiting for other people to do it <laughs> no, yeah. nobody else seems to have the appetite and they seem to have their hands tied yeah. but we all seem to agree that it's something that's needed um so yeah food for thought yeah, I, I would offer that that we have been setting up some of those funds um, to do that to, to varying degrees. The Alaska Accelerator Fund was a group of a private Alaska investors that uh, that set up a fund and deployed two point three million dollars for startups. We can you know pick that apart in lots of different ways. There's another Alaska Venture Fund that's out there that's private money that's investing in small seed grants. I would also suggest you know things like the um, Elmer Rasmussen and the Rasmussen Foundation is another example of private funds that are being used. So I think there are nuggets in there um, that are being used. Is it systematically what we need and all aligned and the policies lined up? I think there's a lot that could be done there, but I'd also suggest that there are a lot of assets and examples of where it has been done that we could build off of as opposed to it being purely a, a, a black or a, a, a missing piece entirely. Yeah, thank you. It's good to know that we wouldn't be starting from zero. I'm, I'm really intrigued by Bradley's approach of trying to build it into the bylaws, what the expectations are. And I think that comes back to framing in the narrative for what it is that we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the by bylaws part, the B Corp type of model um, and, uh, and recognizing that who you put on your cap table affects the trajectory of your business as opposed to just being a check. It's really about setting the, 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 the culture, the, the uh, approach uh, and uh, you really have to look at your cap table more as a as a process of recruiting uh, rather than just fundraising uh, because you're really trying to recruit the right kind of people onto your cap table that bring the right values and expectations in terms of how the, their money will be used and what kind of returns they're going to expect out of that and uh, recruiting is a different way of looking at cap table development. And just just to throw out a quick third way as a, a solution to to the challenge Taylor Post and also um, what you were alluding to, Ryan, was um, you can also bifurcate the board, you know, essentially don't saddle a board with that, that double bind of trying to maximize a return and also have a social responsibility. Um, and functionally, what that looks like is, is the model of having a special shareholder class that gives a separate board veto power. Uh, over the decisions of that board so that that other board can be concerned purely with the social mission and with the the agreement that they will not use that veto power unless they feel the mission's being violated but otherwise stand out of the way and then the board can do what the board is good at which is maximizing returns subject to the approval of of the other so that's that's one way to approach it it's being tried in a few different organizations right now but maybe maybe we'll work all right, it's um, 10, go for it. I'm sorry, who was that? Oh, it was me. I just uh, wanted to kind of emphasize one of the things that I heard Ryan say was that uh, a group funded. And I think in Alaska, that ability to invest in local would be um, supported. I know that I've offered to invest 20,000 to two different businesses and they both told me it wasn't enough and they didn't want my money. And I was like, okay. Um, sure whatever so like if we could group money together so we had you know larger buy-in i i think that that would be good that's a, a good point mita and you know there's two issues there the, the syndication strategy is being used quite successfully if you ever run into that the alaska investor network provides a vehicle uh, special purpose vehicle structure for doing group uh, pooled investment in there. And then also, if you run into any of those near term right now, the 49th State Angel Fund still has some money available for matching to private money. So if you come up with $20,000 for an investment in a business, um, you can walk right over to 49th State Angel Fund and they will match that dollar for dollar and uh, on the same terms, as long as it's not too crazy, um, they'll match that money. So that could have, you know, can be turned immediately into $40,000. 
um, for uh, for an investment. So there are some tools in there to be able to address that. But um, nonetheless, creating a way for that to be less friction, the more awareness of how to do that, when to do it, um, is certainly an issue because there isn't really a good clearinghouse for people to know how to manage that when they run into those opportunities. And you have to kind of know the secrets in the system. Um, so we're just about at witching hour. I wanted to talk about the pitch, um, but I'm not going to uh, do anything more with that. I will just say I'm going to be sending out follow-up notes on that. There's a survey for more evaluation feedback. I hope that you'll complete. We're going to be getting information out to all the participants with stuff. Um, and um, so anyway, I thought it was a good event. Um, and I, I don't know so far that we're getting a tremendous amount of uh, uptake in terms of anyone rushing in saying, hey, I want to work on a challenge. How do I do that? What I am seeing, though, is the collaboration, networking, and communications that were amongst the people that did show up and participate in that. And that's, you know, basically, you know, all I need to see in terms of knowing that we we kind of spurred some of that. If you saw the email, some of you did, some of you haven't, from Stacy Miller at King Tech. She was attending that. She teaches high school business and entrepreneurship. She came back and said, wow, she's taking all this information to her students and informing them about the challenges, getting them involved in that. And to me, that's a home run right there. So again, thank you for everybody in your role in that. Um, I, the only other quick thing that I just want to put out there on the table is, nah, I'm done. I could get started and then I won't stop. And I, I'm checking myself right now. Anybody got anything else for the good of the group you'd like to share today? Um, I did get, um, I stumbled across something uh, in reference to our question from weeks ago about um, healthcare for small businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and I found a reference to um, a woman here in town who works for Liberty Mutual. Her name is Tammy Hewitt Gray. And apparently she specializes in finding health care options for um, it's her Facebook page says helping individuals, families and small businesses curate the information services they need. Information insurance services they need. Um, I have not reached out to her to find out more, but um, I just thought I would throw that out there. Um, I can post a, or send a link to her Facebook page if anybody is interested in, in learning more. That's, that's it. Oh, well, thanks. Anything else? Going once? Going twice? Cool. Thanks all for uh, for jumping in today. Um, we'll we'll dive back a little bit more into calendar and some of the upcoming events next week. But I really appreciate the energy and the enthusiasm for some of the policy related issues that might affect our future. So you all have a great weekend, a long weekend too. Hopefully it's a safe one, and maybe it will be less wet than the forecast is, and you can enjoy some time outside. I'm going to try and get out there. So have a good weekend. So thanks for your hard work on Thank Wednesday. You.